This is our class introduction to the Bible, lesson five. And we're looking at the four biographical books. We looked at them in the earlier lessons. The book of Matthew was written primarily to the Jews. <clears throat> we showed evidence of that. The book of Mark was written primarily to the Romans or people who think like the Romans. The book of Luke was written primarily to Greeks or those who think like Greeks. And the book of John sets forth the deity of Jesus. All four end where Acts begins. We will relate this lesson to the Apostolic Commission given to the Apostles. Prior to the 18th century, there was no record of the Apostolic Commission being called the Great Commission that I can find. The New Testament teaches that the Apostles fulfilled their commission. I think the term Great Commission is probably used because the in Matthew chapter 10, there was a limited commission that was only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the gospel was only preached to the Jews for a seven year period, according to Daniel 9. That was three and a half years of the Lord's personal ministry and three and a half years after Pentecost of Acts 2. And so that commission was to all the world, and that's probably why it's called the Great Commission. The New Testament teaches that the apostles fulfilled their commission. The early church fathers of the second and third centuries taught that the apostles fulfilled their commission. We'll be showing this as well. I document all this in my, my book, uh, The Great Commission, uh, published in 2007. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 records this commission. Mark 16, 14 through 20 records this commission. Luke 24, 36 through 49 also records this commission. John 20, verses 19 to 23 records this commission. Other passages that record it or at least relate to the commission are Acts 1, 4 through 8, Acts 10, 39 through 43, Acts 26, 16 through 18 and Romans 10, 12 through 16. Perhaps other verses as well. Let's look at Matthew 28, 16. But the seven disciples went into Galilee into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Note that the commission was given to the 11 disciples who, be, who became apostles. So the 11 disciples. In Matthew 28, 18, the next verse, Jesus came to them and spake of them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore, someone's got their mic on, so, sorry. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We'll be looking at these passages in a little bit of detail here next. In Mark's account, and afterward he was manifest unto the eleven, notice the eleven themselves, as they sat at meat and they upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them that had seen him after he had was risen. That's important that we remember that the evidence was going to be established by means of testimony. And the credibility of the witnesses uh, would, in, would uh, be important. And so they did not believe them that had seen him after it was written. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. So Mark 16, 14 through 16. Verse 17, and these signs shall accompany them or follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents as they drink any deadly thing and shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is miraculous accompaniment with the Great Commission 
or the apostolic commission. In Mark 16, 19, so then the Lord, after he had spoken of them, was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed. Amen. So that they went forth. And of course, this is the, the uh, disciples that were commissioned. There were 11 of them at this time. And Judas Iscariot had committed suicide. He had not been replaced yet, and he wasn't replaced until Acts chapter 1. Luke's account, and as they spake these things, he himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they beheld a spirit, because he, they were in a, in a room that was closed or locked. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And wherefore does questions arise in your heart? So now he's going to give them evidence that he is, in fact, Jesus who was crucified. See my hands and my feet, that is, I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you behold me having. So here's his body has been resurrected and it still has the prints of the nails in it and uh, in the side as well. We see uh, from other passages that they were, were you know, instructed to trust, uh, as Thomas was instructed to trust his hands in his side. So where, what we have here, Jesus is giving them evidence that he is, in fact, the one who was crucified and resurrected. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So he told them to handle him which means do more than look. And so they they handled him. We see this in the first chapter of the book of 1 John as well. While they still disbelieved for, for joy and wondered, he says unto them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and ate before them. And he says unto them, these are my words that I spake unto you while I said with you that all things must need be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And open he their mind that they might understand the scriptures. So he began to expound unto them the scriptures. And he saith unto them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. So he's showing them scriptures that prophesied of this is what he's doing in this context. We, we just have a summary of it. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name unto all the nations. Now they didn't get this point, but it was to be preached in the all, to all the nations. That would include the Gentiles. The word nations is the same word translated Gentiles, beginning from Jerusalem. So this preaching was to begin from Jerusalem. And that's exactly what the apostles did. You're witnesses of these things. So the ones of, to whom he's pre uh, uh, commanding to go forth and preach and teach, these are ones that uh, are witnesses of these things. And since we can't be witnesses today, this certainly does not apply to us. That is, the witnessing certainly doesn't. And behold, I send forth the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city until be clothed with power from on high. Again, there was miraculous power that was to come, and they would have tarry in Jerusalem, and they would begin their preaching in Jerusalem. Now, the Lord's Church had a had a group that formed a missionary society about, about the time of the Civil War in the United States. <clears throat> there were two missionary societies formed. There was one that was formed and they took this literally and they went, they sent their first missionaries to Jerusalem. And uh, and it was pretty much an, a failure. And uh, then there was another one formed a little bit later, uh, which did not do that. But they lit, took this literally and they applied it to themselves. In John 20, verse 19 and following, when therefore it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. 
And when he had said this, he showed them unto them his hands and his side. The disciples therefore were glad when they saw the Lord. So again here, John records this. Let's go all the way through verse 23. Jesus therefore said unto them, Peace be unto you, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. The word send here is implying that they're going to be sent forth as apostles with authority. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. The breathing is probably symbolic because the Hebrew word for spirit or ruach is uh, the word for wind or breath. And the word for and the Greek word is pneuma is also the word for wind or breath. And so he breathed on them probably symbolic and saith unto them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the miraculous endowments, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, or perhaps baptism by the Holy Spirit might be a better translation of it. Whosoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven of them. Whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. We don't have this authority to retain and remit sins, but they did because they did it through the doctrine that they preached. And uh, so it was through that doctrine that they did this. In verse 4 of Acts 1, now the books of Luke and Acts, if you put them, the last chapter of Luke, it'll just fit together like a hand in a glove with the first chapter of Acts. And being assembled together with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. We saw that in Luke 24, which said, hey, you heard from me. So you heard this promise from me. He's not talking about something that uh, was uh, to come later. Uh, that That is, he, I don't think he's talking about the Old Testament prophecy here. He's saying, I gave you this promise. Now, the promise did refer to the Old Testament prophecy, Joel's prophecy. But he said, you heard this from me. For John indeed baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit or the word in could be by the Holy Spirit, might be by, by means of the Holy Spirit imparting miraculous powers to them. Uh, ye shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. John baptized in water, but you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If we go back to John, whatever he, when he spoke of this, he said that the he, the Messiah would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And so this baptism in the Holy Spirit was at the behest of Jesus. He did this. And of course, it follows through that the authority was given him by the Father, Matthew 28, 18. And then he ascended to heaven. After he ascended to heaven, he received gifts for men. And that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and following. <coughs> And he gave gifts unto men, is what's uh, it's translated in Ephesians 4. But it's a quote from the Old Testament where it says he received gifts for men. The Hebrew word means to fetch something and then go get it and bring it back or send it back. And that's precisely what Jesus did. He went to heaven and then sent back, that is sent the Holy Spirit back to guide the apostles into all truth so that they might remit sins and retain sins. Those who obeyed the apostles' doctrine would have their sins remitted, and those who refused to obey would have their sins retained. So John baptized with water. Jesus said, but you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. They, therefore, when they were come together, asked him, saying, Lord, does thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They still had a problem with their con conception of the kingdom, and it's going to have to get this wrong idea out of their thinking. Verse 7 continues, and he said of them, it is not for you to know the times or season which the Father set within his own authority. But ye, sh but ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. So we see a threefold three division here. We're going to lay this out later. But right here, 
the threefold division is they're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So the Holy Spirit coming brought power, that miraculous power, enabled them to be witnesses. Of course, this is fulfilling of John 14, where the Spirit would guide them in all truth and they would have infallible memories of what had happened. And so they would be his witnesses. And they would be in Jerusalem, notice, comma, and in all Judea and Samaria, comma. Now, I know the King James has the comma differently, but the way that English is worded here, this is one place, Jerusalem, and then second, there's a, a construction to be witnesses and the Spirit would be with them, be witnesses in Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria, because there's not a comma after Judea, there isn't the King James, but all the other translations leave it out. Uh, Judea and Samaria treated as one place. And so it was one province basically of, of the Roman Empire. And the Greek bears this out that, that the American study really is correct. I, def, I have a defense of this in one of my writings. I've forgotten which one it is. And on the uttermost part of the earth, so we have a threefold division. They would begin in Jerusalem, then they would go to Judea and Samaria, and then they would go to the uttermost part of the earth. That would be everywhere. Any comments or questions? Well, you see this going everywhere, and Paul and Peter went everywhere. Paul became one of the leaders, but we see Peter here in Acts 10, and Peter says, we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom also they slew hanging him on a tree. He's obviously referring to Jesus, and we, and we, the witnesses, are the apostles. And they were witnesses, which he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. That would be in Judea and in Galilee. And Galilee was a different Roman province. They had a different governor and ruler. And so we have Judea and Galilee. And he says, Jerusalem, whom also they slew, hanging him on a tree. Him God raised up the third day, the third day he was resurrected, and gave him to be made manifest. So he showed him manifest to witnesses, to a bunch of people. But it wasn't to all the people that it was manifest. It was only to witnesses that were chosen before God. So there were chosen witnesses. Even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So the chosen witnesses here in this context were those who ate and drank with him. This appears to be the apostles. But he did eat and drink with other people who were witnesses also. In Acts 10, 42, let's go back now, where we ended with verse 41, it's the next verse. And he charged us to preach unto the people and to testify, the word testify is to give testimony or witnessing, that this is he who was ordained of God to be judge of the living and the dead. So right here, he charged us, who's us? So well, that's the apostles, to preach to the people to testify that this is he who is ordained of God to be the judge and living of the dead. To him bear the, all the prophets witness. Now then, as a, a in accordance with the Jewish scriptures, the Jews were commanded to require two things of one who claimed to be a prophet. In Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, the two things were whatever they preached had to harmonize with all the scriptures they possessed, and they had to show signs that would always come to pass. And so we see the apostles doing this. We've already seen the sign in Acts 10. And this happened in Acts chapter 10. And of course, uh, this uh, was a sign that was to, it was a sign to the, to the Jews, actually. The miraculous gifts was. And this is borne out from the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that, uh, that, that uh, it was a sign to unbelieving Jews. And uh, when you study 1 Corinthians, you can see this. As he quotes from, the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. 
But he charged us, the apostles, to preach unto the people and to testify that this is he who is ordained to God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him bear all the prophets witness that through his name everyone that believeth on him should receive remission of sins. So this is universal. So this now makes this commission a universal thing, different than the limited commission of Matthew 10, which was only to the Jews. I believe God had a good reason to take it to the Jews first, because they were a prepared people and he could use those who were good material, that, that is, they were very uh, believers and they were honest hearted. Those people would make a good force to take the gospel to other people and other nations. And I believe that's what he was preparing them to do. Skip to Acts 26 now. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul now speaking. But arise and stand upon thy feet, and for this end I have appeared unto thee. That is, he's given account of God, the Lord appearing to him. And he says, I appeared unto thee to appoint thee a minister and a witness, both of the things wherein thou hast seen of me, seen me, and of the things wherein I appear will appear unto thee. I'm convinced that the Apostle Paul had all the qualifications of the other apostles. He had seen the Lord, and it's not just on the road to Damascus, because he said, wherein I will appear to thee, in later passages, he talks about the many visions he had. I suspect, I cannot prove this, but I strongly suspect that the Apostle Paul was, through visions, was able to see the teaching of the Lord in his personal ministry. And he was able to see all of those things that had happened, which qualified him to be an apostle. So he says, though the things were and I would appear to thee, that everything from the people, that would be from the Jews and from the Gentiles, and him I, will, I send thee. So he sent him to Gentiles. But later verses will show he was sent to the Greeks. He was sent to the Greek speaking Gentiles. I believe the other apostles, many of them, were sent to other nations. We see historical evidence of this. And he goes on in verse 18, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness, talk about the Gentiles, and particularly the Greek-speaking Gentiles, they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Darkness and the power of Satan are, are the same thing, and, and light and... Uh, and returning to uh, turning to the power of God uh, would be the uh, equivalent of light. Light, opening their eyes and, and seeing light. That uh, unto God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in thee. So he's talking about the Gentiles receiving remission of sins. And they're also going to receive an inheritance. And of course, our inheritance would begin with the being members of the church and end with us being in heaven eventually, if we're faithful unto death. Let's skip over to Romans now, the book of Romans chapter 10. But there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. See, that distinction is now broken down. It, the distinction began to be broken down in Acts 10, when the gospel was preached to the Gentiles and they became, became members of the church without having to become proselyte Jews. They did not have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Well, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. See, now he's talking about Jews and Greeks, not Jews and Gentiles. See, he's apostle to the Greeks. For the same Lord is Lord of all and is rich unto all that call upon, upon him. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament. And you need to go back and study that more fully. That's in Job. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? <clears throat> the Greeks do not, even with their language, don't function like the English language. The English language is a language that's tied pretty largely to time. Our tenses indicate time, past tense and past time. Future tense is future time, present tense is present time. And so we, we have that in English, 
But in Greek, the, the uh, aorist tense and the imperfect tense may be in the indicative mood, may indicate time in the past, but that's just incidental. The primary points is a kind of action. So let's go back and look at it. Think of it as a Jew, as a Greek would see this. He is saying they shall cast out their call and they're not believed. So he's put, giving in the reverse order the sequence of someone calling on him. In order to call, they have to believe. Okay. So the Jews were thinking in a logical sequence. The Greeks, I'm sorry, were thinking in a logical sequence. So they had to call, they had to believe. And they, in order to believe, they had to hear the message. They have to, they have to come in contact with the evidence. And that to hear, how are they going to hear unless someone teaches or preaches to them? Okay. And how shall they preach if someone, unless they're sent out to do the preaching? Then he says, even as it's written, now he begins to quote from Isaiah, how beautiful the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things. Now the word glad tidings is the same word as gospel. And he says, but they did not all hearken to the glad tidings to the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believed our report. So the word report here is the word of koai in Greek, which means it, it, is, a, it is a sound. And... Uh, and so it is that which is a, a report, and it's translated in the next verse, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that's in the King James Version. The word hearing is the same word translated report here in uh, verse uh, 17. It's translated report verse 60, the word hearing in verse 17 is the same word, trans Greek word that is, as translated report back in verse 16. So it should have been translated report. Lord hath believed our report. So the report cometh by. So faith cometh by the report. See, the faith that he's talking about that they had to have came through the report, through the, through the gospel, which is identified as that glad tidings or gospel. And then report by the word of God, by that message that came from God. Questions or comments? The gospel was to be preached in all the world before AD 70. In Matthew 24, 14, we see this. In Mark 13, 9 through 11. This is what the scriptures tell us. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. All right to destruction of Jerusalem now. There's a division in Matthew 24. Yes, I agree, but the first 34 verses definitely refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. We can see this when we put in the parallel accounts of Mark 13 and Luke 21, but they relate to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army under the direction of the Roman general Titus, who was the son of the emperor Vespasian. And but Titus himself later became emperor at, after his father's death. And then his son, his brother came, became emperor after his death. So there's a lineage now, a new uh, group of rulers in the, in the Roman Empire. <clears throat> they, they took over uh, Otho, Vitellus, and Galba were three emperors in about two years that were, uh, that were really displaced or taken out of, out of their emperorship. Uh, they lost it and uh, they were killed really, basically. And uh, it was probably uh, Vespasian's son, Domitian, who was in Rome at that time that was behind all of it. And so that his father could become emperor. Okay. But let's go back to Matthew 24. Vespasian was in charge of the Roman army in AD 66 when the Jews rebelled against Rome. Nero was emperor at that time. Vespasian was declared emperor in AD 69, December the 21st. Vespasian left his son Titus in charge of the Roman army that was fighting the Jews. So his son Titus then was in charge of the army. <clears throat> let's, let's look at Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations. See the witness or testimony. 
and then shall the end come. This will be the end of the of the Jewish uh, state. That is the, the destruction of Jerusalem. That's the end. Not a reference to the second coming of our Lord. It's a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem that occurred in AD 70. But the gospel would be preached in the whole world for a testimony, a witness unto all the nations. Now, let me point out here, this was a witness. The witnessing had to be done by true witnesses. We are not witnesses today for the resurrection of Jesus. We will take the testimony of the witnesses proving that he was resurrected. We need to logically make arguments from it. But I am not a witness, and no person living today is a witness that is living on this earth today, is a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. So this testimony uh, or witnessing that was to all nations was by men who were witnesses. And this, these apostles were witnesses. I'm convinced that God preserved the lives of all the apostles except James, and I think there's a good reason for allowing him to die. But uh, what well, we have James, the son of Zebedee, I'm talking about <clears throat> in Acts 12. All the rest of them were allowed, were allowed to live. Now, they were abused. They were beaten. They were driven forth. They were mistreated. But they continued and gave their testimony throughout the whole world. I'm convinced that Apostle, some apostle came to North and South America, Australia, and other places in the world. Now, in Mark 13, 9, but take he, he heed to yourselves, ye apostles. So he's talking to his apostles. Well, they shall deliver you up to councils, and in synagogues shall you be beaten, and before governors and kings shall you stand for my sake. For a testimony, there it is, that's that witness again. And to them, now we can't be witnesses. We can we can preach and teach the gospel and teach and show that these men that were witnesses were, were uh, true witnesses and that they were telling the truth. We can give arguments for that, but we are not going to give a testimony. I know our our denominational friends claim that it happens all the time. They claim that's preaching. It was preaching of the apostles and other men who were indeed truly witnesses. But it's not for us today. We're just preachers and teachers of what the gospel teaches in the scriptures. That's all we are. In verse 10, and the gospel shall first be preached unto all the nations. There it is. They, it must first be preached unto all the nations. And then, of course, the ends are going to want to, they lead you to judgment, Mark 13 says. There you have, be not anxious before in what you shall speak, but whatsoever shall be given you, and that hour shall you shall speak you. That's not for us, <laughs> because I have to study, and then I mess up and, and get my words wrong. But uh, I am fallible. The apostles were infallible in what they preached. They were guided miraculously. Now, this doesn't mean they couldn't sin in their lives. They could, but they did not, were not allowed to preach error and teach error when they got up to preach. And so let me go back and read this verse again because it's so important. When they lead you to judgment, you apostles, deliver you up, be not anxious. Don't you worry, don't you fret. Don't worry or be anxious beforehand what you shall speak. Why? You don't need to worry about pre preparing sermons. I prepared notes on this. And, uh, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. So the Holy Spirit's going to give it to you. Why do you not have to worry? Because for, for it, for is going to explain why. It is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was guiding their speech. That is, they were speaking by inspiration. I believe in verbal plenary inspiration. We will not go through and explain that in great detail at this time. This commission was fulfilled in the book of Acts. Mark 16, 20 tells us that they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed. Amen. 
many of those that are what I call skeptics as far as the source of the Bible and what is called source criticism. They, they think that Mark was the source for the other Gospels, that is, for, particularly for Matthew and Luke. They call them synoptic Gospels. I think Mark was probably the last one written of the three Gospels. That is, Matthew, in my judgment, was probably written uh, within a year or two after Pentecost. And uh, the uh, Luke was probably written not too much longer after Acts 10. Uh, Luke came into, into bear, and, and I believe he was inspired by God to write. And as the Apostle Paul laid his hands on him. And then Mark, he's recording that they'd gone everywhere. This was near the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. I would have Mark to be written later than the other two books. That's what I would have for that reason. Notice, let's go back and they went forth and preached everywhere. So they fulfilled that commission to go into all the world. The Lord working with them, and he's going to do it. He said, let's go back and see how he's going to do it. Back here in Mark 13 and 11, he would, the Holy Spirit would be guiding them. The Lord would be working with them. And then he says here, they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed and he said, so be it, or amen. The commission was fulfilled in the book of Acts. We see this in Mark 16, 20, Romans 1. Hey, well, look at these verses here in a minute. But in Mark 16, 20, he says it was fulfilled. And so when Mark was written, this had been fulfilled. Now, there are some claims, and there's a possibility that the book of Mark was, most of it was written. Uh, at one time, and then later, Mark added to it by inspiration. I would have no problem with that. Uh, uh, that's one of the claims for why the verses, the uh, last part of uh, Mark 16 is not in some of the manuscripts. That's one of the explanations. It's a plausible explanation. There's no pro I have no problem with it as far as uh, because Mark, if he was continuing to be inspired of God, he could still be writing inspiration. So that's no problem. I don't necessarily believe that to be the right argument to explain the absence of the last uh, verses were about Mark 16, 14, on or verse 10, somewhere there about verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Let's go to Romans 1, 8. Paul said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. Now, I understand the term whole world could just be throughout the Roman Empire, but that means that the gospel had spread that far at least. And uh, we have evidence that the writings uh, of the early church told us how the apostle went into various places. And the Apostle Thomas was supposed to go gone to India and preach there. And uh, there's some evidence that that's true. Uh, and uh, and uh, other apostles went to other parts of the world. Some we don't know where they went to. In Romans 10, 18, a passage we already looked at, Romans 10, 17, we led up to it. But he said, but I say, did they not hear? Now let's go back to Romans 10, 7, it's so that faith cometh by hearing by the report, see the report of verse 16, which is equal to the gospel, verse 15, Romans 10. But I say, did they, did they not hear? Yea, verily the sound went out into all the earth, in other words, unto the ends of the world. That's pretty, pretty uh, emphatic. I want you to notice here that we have different expressions that are employed for how far it went throughout the whole world. Well, I've got three expressions underlined right here throughout the whole world and to all the earth and unto the ends of the world, different expressions, all saying the same thing. It went forth and preached everywhere, Mark 16, 20. See, and uh, so right here, everywhere, Mark 16, 20. Uh, Romans 1, 8, throughout the whole world, Romans 10, 18, into all the earth, and also into the ends of the world. We're going to see some other expressions. 
we don't have the same expression. We have different expressions saying it in different ways. How can we miss it that this was to the whole world? Because he uses different expressions. In Colossians 1 6, it's in all the world. We'll get to it in just a moment. See it, notice it's underlined. Because the hope which is laid up for you in the heavens, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. See, they heard it in the gospel, which was preached by the apostles and those upon whom they laid their hands and those whom they sent forth, which is coming to you, even as it is also in all the world. Again, if you look at these other expressions, we don't have that expression, all the world, or else but let's look at them. Into the world, into all the earth, throughout the whole world, everywhere. Again, each expression is different. And they're all saying essentially the same thing with different words. I think he's telling us that this was everywhere, and he's doing it in a different wording for emphasis. Bearing fruit and increasing as it does unto you also, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. So he come unto you even as it is into all the world. Again, a different wording. Now then, we have a different wording again in Colossians 1.23. It's underlined. We'll get to it in a moment. If so be that you continue in the faith, the faith being the gospel, and that's borne out with the last three verses of, of Galatians chapter 1. And the gospel it was that which Paul had made havoc. Uh, he had made havoc of the faith, and that's identified in the further part of Galatians 1 as the gospel. So that you continue in the faith, or you continue in the New Testament, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard in the gospel and the faith are identified in Galatians 1 as the same thing. The faith and the gospel are the same thing. Which you heard, which was preached in all creation under heaven. Again, different wording. Go back to those other wordings and you see it's not the same words. Again, he used a different way of expressing it, whereby Paul was made a minister. The gospel was, well, now I've, I've summarized them all, put them all together, was preached in the whole world, Matthew 24, 14, under all the nations, Mark 13, 10, everywhere, Mark 16, 20, throughout the whole world, Romans 1, 8, into all the world, Romans 10, 18, and all the world, Colossians 1, 5, and in all creation under heaven, Colossians 1, 20, 10, we miss it, it went to the whole earth, everywhere on this globe. That's what it's saying. Now, someone says, well, Marion, where is the evidence? Where is this evidence from history that this happened? I don't have to have evidence. If there is, someone says, if you have evidence that it happened, then it happened. That's true. And then they argue, say, we don't have evidence that it happened. Therefore, it didn't happen. That commits a logical fallacy of denying the antecedent. It's logically fallacious. Because I don't know something to be true and can't prove it doesn't mean it's not true. Right? So it's important that we understand how to reason properly. The apostles fulfilled their commission. They did what Jesus told them to do. And that's these are verses telling us they did in all different words. But count the number of ways. One, I'm just going to count them with my fingers. Matthew 4, 24, 14, Mark 13, 10, Mark 16, 20, Romans 1, 8, Romans 10, 18, Colossians 1, 5, and Colossians 1, 20. That's seven different ways he said it. I think that's very interesting. The Jews, to them, seven was a pretty important number. <laughs> okay. In fact, when they made a covenant, they would seven it. And that's, uh, that's where that, uh, that's the term that was used by them. So, the apostles, I believe, fulfilled their commission. We have seven different ways of saying it, and none of them are the same, but they say essentially the same thing. Now, <clears throat> my book, and it, uh, there's additional resources on the Apostolic Commission, and this, this link here is no longer a good link. I'm trying to get it up on another website, and I will eventually. 
Uh, no. Appointments were not under this commission because it was given to the apostles, and certainly we can't be witnesses and we can't work miracles, but we're obligated to do parts of it, just like we're not under the Ten Commandments, but we're obligated to obey nine of them. Why are we not under the Ten Commandments? Because it was a part of the law of Moses. Why are we under nine of them? Because nine of them were given again in the New Testament. But the, the commandment, uh, remember the Sabbath day was not given again in the New Testament. So that one we're not under. So we're not under the Ten Commandments. And someone says, well, you don't believe in keeping the Ten Commandments. No, I don't. I keep nine of the same commandments because they're timeless principles. Their principles began in Eden and they continue in the patriarchal system. They continue in the, under the law of Moses and they continue under the Christian dispensation. We're obligated to obey nine of them because they're in the New Testament. They were also in the, under the patriarchal law and under the uh, law of Moses because they're timeless principles of right and wrong. Obligated to teach the laws. Why? Because the New Testament teaches this, that we're to teach them. Other passages teach us. Just because the apostles were told to go and preach in Jerusalem doesn't mean I have to go preach in Jerusalem. I've never been to Jerusalem. I think I can go to heaven without going to Jerusalem. In fact, I'm kind of fearful of trying to go to Jerusalem right now with all that warfare going on over there. I'm sitting even going there, maybe getting killed uh, because I'm there to try to preach. Besides, I've gone and preached in other places in the world, and I know some of the men in this in this class right now have been to other places in the world. But they've gone because we love the lost, because we love God, we love our neighbor, and we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, love our neighbor as ourselves. Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. We summarize in the lesson of the years. These four books end with the ascension of our Lord and his commission to his apostles to preach the gospel to the whole world. And the book of Acts picks up where Luke left off. In fact, the last part of Luke overlaps with the first part of Acts. If you put them together, you can see that. Acts and the epistles record that the apostles fulfilled their commission. We've already shown that with scripture. This was commonly taught in the early church and in the restored church of the 19th century. Let's talk. Are there questions?